Now, the, one of the treatments, or one of the times when we do this procedure, it's called an external ventricular drain, is when there's intraventricular blood. You can imagine that some of these blood products will um, either from a, you know, physically block off the flow of cerebrospinal fluid, or as a product, product, the blood products break down, they could basically, uh, as they're absorbed, they could scar some of the arachnoid granulations, which are used to absorb CSF, and it could lead to hydrocephalus. So which hydro water, cephalus brain, condition of, of water on the brain. So the treatment for this is placement of an external ventricular drain. And this is something that you can do, you know, as an your intern year at the bedside. We use different anatomical landmarks to help guide where to place the incision and um, how to place the actual catheter. But the idea is you make a small incision in the skin in the right frontal area. We choose the right frontal area because most people, even left-handed people, have language on the left side. And if you say frontal, you know, ahead of the coronal suture, you stay away from the motor strip. So after you make a small opening in the skull, you'll make an opening in the dura, and then you pass your catheter into the ventricle. It's tunneled out under the skin and attached to this drainage bag at the bedside. And the nice thing about this is that you really have complete control over the patient's cerebrospinal fluid. You're able to drop the bag lower than the level of the head, and you can drain more fluid. And these are usually centered over the level of the tragus. All right, so something you'll very, get very familiar with. And we discussed this a little bit earlier, but just to review, um, this is the flow of cerebrospinal fluid. So we'll shift gears and we'll talk a little more about um, CSF. Um, so cord plexus makes CSF. This is produced in the lateral ventricle, travels into the third ventricle by way of the foramen of Monroe. This goes through the Sylvian aqueduct into the fourth ventricle. From there, it goes out of <clears throat> a few different foramen or openings round of um, Magendi and Luchka, or it's also referred to as the median aperture for Magendi. This fluid uh, will actually go around and bathe the brain. It then gets absorbed into the arachnoid granulations, which uh, dump the fluid into the venous system. And this cycle repeats. So at any time you have about 150 cc's of fluid, CSF in the body. <coughs> Excuse me. And this gets turned over about three times a day. I'll take a quick sip of uh, water here. All right. So with that knowledge, we can talk a little more about hydrocephalus. So a very important um, concept I wanted to convey was communicating versus non-communicating hydrocephalus. So if you think about a river, if you were to build a dam, some of that fluid would, would build up upstream. So very similar situation you could think of, basically a plumbing problem where Let's say in this example, the green arrow is showing these aqueducts. If this is very narrow, you'll see a buildup of fluid upstream. So you see enlargement of the, the lateral ventricles in the fourth and the third ventricle. In this example, um, you see that everything is, is enlarged, the lateral, the third, and the fourth. So this first example where there's a, you know, a, a pinch point here, that's called obstructive hydrocephalus or non-communicating, meaning that all the ventricles are not in direct connection or communication with each other. You see the fourth ventricle is very small, the rest are enlarged. Here, everything is enlarged, so we call that communicating hydrocephalus, where there's really no focal obstruction. The obstruction is, is really at the end of the pathway where the, the CSF is not getting absorbed or too much is being produced. So that's important in guiding some of your, your treatments. So for communicating hydrocephalus, um, Basically, uh, VP shunt or ventricular peritoneal shunt placement is, is indicated. This is kind of our gold standard. And I'd be remiss not to include this as a, as a pediatric neurosurgeon since this is a big, big part of our practice. But very quickly, a, a shunt involves an incision in the scalp, placement of a, a catheter into the ventricle, just like with an external ventricular drain. It's connected to a valve that can, in some cases, be regulated to change how much flow, how much CSF is drained and then that's tunneled under the skin to another part of the body. Most commonly, this goes into the peritoneal space, and then the walls of the abdomen will absorb this fluid. In older kids, we can place it into the pleural space, so the place around the lungs. Fluid's absorbed by the chest wall, or you know, the other option is to place it intracardia, so into the heart, and this fluid will, will drain directly into the bloodstream, very similar to the way you would place a central line. And I just thought, um, some of you may be familiar with this, just to show you a few of the adjuncts we use in the operating room. This um, is an example of neuronavigation, where 
there's a fixed reference point on the patient and an electromagnet close by. You then basically take a pointer that's not shown here, but you trace the contours of the face. And then a computer will register this information and hook, you know, basically um, correlate it with, with the imaging, the MRI that you've obtained preoperatively, such that if I touch the patient's nose, you'll see a dot on the patient's nose. And I'm sure as many of you have seen on your rotations, this has really revolutionized how we do shunt surgery as well as tumor surgery. You're able to plan out your exact um, trajectory, where you're going to enter, where you're going to end, where your target is, the distance, help you plan the length of your catheter, and really help to get catheters very precisely in, in very small locations. Uh, just to share another approach here, for patients with obstructive hydrocephalus, let's say, for example, the one that we looked at where the aqueduct was very narrowed, you can actually come in and do a procedure where you leave no hardware. And a lot of this um, grew out of experience in Africa where neurosurgeons would volunteer their time for about a month, place many shunts, but shunts are not perfect systems. They're made of plastic, they can fracture, they can break, pull out. When these neurosurgeons left the country, these, these kids really didn't have a treatment to, to deal with these complications. So this procedure was developed as a way to treat hydrocephalus without having to leave any hardware behind. And this involves um, similarly, a, you know, a burr hole and opening the bone, passing this time an endoscope, which is basically a camera with a light at the end, into the ventricle. So going through the lateral ventricle, through frame of Monroe into the third ventricle. That shown in pictures here, this is the lateral ventricle, some choroid plexus leading through the frame of Monroe. When we pass through, it looks at this view. Here we're passing a, uh, basically a Foley catheter pretty much, same thing we do with the bladder. Passing this balloon tipped uh, catheter in and expanding this, uh, the floor of the third ventricle. So we're basically poking through in order to create a new channel for CSF to drain within the body. So a very, um, you know, in my opinion, a very beautiful surgery where you can really see all the anatomy. Uh, the fornix runs in this area. These are some large veins along the septum and the thalamus. These are the mammillary bodies. And really below this uh, tuft of arachnoid is the basal artery and the uh, posterior cerebral artery. So a very high stakes high real estate kind of territory here where you're working. Okay, and then just to, to help you when you start to see these patients, um, you know, in the emergency room with shunts, for instance, preoperatively, you have a patient with very large ventricles, signs of increased pressure, place a shunt, the ventricles come down. If you see them back and the ventricles are back up, that's definitely consistent with a shunt failure. The only reason I put this slide in is that an important learning point is that not all patients who have shunt failures have enlargement of their ventricles. So if you see it, that, that really supports shunt failure. If you don't, it doesn't really exclude it. Just something to keep in mind. And here's an example of a patient that we did on ETV where they had aqueductal stenosis and the ventricles came down afterwards. <clears throat> I put this, this slide in here because that's not always the case. Um, I would say VP shunt is a much more um, effective way of decreasing the ventricle size whereas ETV, you do not always see such a dramatic decrease in the ventricle size. And of course, studies are still going to see if that has clinical significance or not. Here are some examples of shunt valves. It's one in the center here. There, there are numerous different types, but the idea is that with the lateral skull x-ray, you could usually get a good look at some of the markings. This is the catheter going in the ventricle. This is the valve, and then this gets tunneled down to the abdomen or another body site. Just another picture that the axials on bone windows can be very helpful to trace the, the valve and tubing. Just as a good reference for you, the International Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery has a website they call the Shunt Guide that has pretty much all of the uh, commonly used valves on the market. It goes through the, the radiographic appearance of each, the different pressure settings. So I'd say this is, this is a website to check out and to kind of save in your favorites for when you're an intern. And trying to sort out which valves people have. Very, very helpful. I put this slide in just to show that, you know, I've been showing very normal ventricles. However, there are, are plenty of patients with um, abnormal ones. This is a patient with holoprosencephaly, where some of the midline structures do not fuse and there's really just one large ventricle. And this is, this is on a continuum. And this is just an example of some dysmorphic ventricles. They just look very abnormal. And you can tell this patient has a shunt. You can see the valve here on the side. 
everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.